I had a good time last night. It was a very enjoyable dinner. The questions that I got were extraordinary. Uh, I was not, originally I thought it was just going to be some softballs thrown, but I felt like I was at a professional Major League Baseball game last night for all the hard pitches that were thrown at me. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, have two, a mission, I have two missions today. One, I want to stimulate your desire to be a marine biologist. The other thing I want to do today is I want to stick with the theme of Georgia Military College. The one word. That's a new theme that they've been doing for the past, I guess, year. But the one word I want to share with you today is intelligence. Because you've proven that you're already smart by choosing Georgia Military College. We all make decisions. Some are informed, some are not. But I want to commend you for choosing GMC. Everybody assumes that I graduated as a, from the Corps of Cadets in 1985. But I was a staff sergeant on active duty in the United States Air Force. And I went to the PX one day, and I ran into my scoutmaster from earlier in my life, and I found out that he was the director of the off-campus program for Georgia Military College at Moody Air Force Base, where I was born and raised. My father had been to 06 on camp on the, on the base, and I had decided that college wasn't really what I wanted to do, and I ran into him. And he said, what are you doing with your life? He said, GMC can give you the opportunity that you need, Buck, to get a foot up. And I went and I enrolled in the, in the evening program and I doubled up. I already had 35 credits from Valdosta State College. And then I decided to finish up with an associate's degree. And on the day that I got out of the Air Force and transitioned into civilian life, I had an associate's degree from Georgia Military College, which enabled me to be accepted as a junior to Florida State University. So, I just want to commend you for the one word for the day, intelligence. You've proven that you're smart. You've proven that you've got what it takes to make good decisions. Now take the lessons you're learning here at GMC and make even greater decisions. Georgia Military College gave me the opportunity to improve my life and my family's standing in life. I went on to get a commission in the Florida Army National Guard while I was a student at Florida State two years before I would have gotten it if I'd gone in the ROTC program. So I came in the service in April of 81. I retired in, on September 1st, 2016. I did 35 years either on active duty or in the reserves or through deployment, and I miss it. But I owe what I got my start to Georgia Military College. I branched infantry, in the, and I also served in the Georgia, Mil Georgia National Guard, and I served in the Army Reserve. But I was infantry my entire life. That's a little bit about me. I've been married for four, almost 40 years. Um, my wife went with me on our first uh, overseas tour. Uh, I have two children. Both of them are college graduates. Um, my oldest boy owns uh, a business called southernpigskin.com. does very well. He's also a commentator for ESPN. And my younger son is a water quality specialist. He has a master's degree in public health. And he's loving life, and I've got three grandchildren. So, and I'm trying to brainwash my uh, oldest grandson to come to school here. So let's get this party started. I'm the Compliance and Enforcement Manager for the Georgia Department of Natural Resources Coastal Resource Division. Um, this position used to be a law enforcement position, uh, and uh, they changed it about 20 years ago. I supervised law enforcement officers 
up until 20 years ago, and then we changed it to a, what we call a civil enforcement. This is what we do. My jurisdiction is everything in the blue there. I have three employees that we enforce various laws, but the main ones that we enforce is the Coastal Marshes Protection Act, the Shore Protection Act, and what we call the Revocable License Authority. I'm way down here, but we work with, our entire staff works together. Uh, part of the role that I play is that we review all legal documents that come into the department, including for all the other sections here that are working with me. We assist local communities so if you have a desire to, to seek out a marine biology degree or a marine sciences or wildlife management degree, this is what we do. Um, we try to encourage sustainable growth. We try to uh, encourage green thinking. One of the things we do a lot of is monitoring the, the wetlands associated with saltwater marsh. And we do enhancements. Oops, wrong. So if you see right here, this is this bank before, this is the bank after we did a oyster culture reef. We take bags of used oysters that have been shucked and we establish a new shoreline which encourages greater water quality. These are all the, the, the groups that we work with. The only one, oh, it's up there. Um, so we are intricately involved in the coastal zone and the coastal management of the, of the state of Georgia. Now the coast is 115 miles north to south. It's approximately 1,500 square miles. My jurisdiction goes three miles out to sea and 65 to 75 miles inland. We get most of our money, if not all of our money, from the federal government. It doesn't mean you're, going, you're limited on your career. The money has been here for 30 years, and uh, as, as I have, I've been with the department for 30 years, so there's no chance of y'all, if you choose a career with the Coastal Resources Division, of you losing funding for your job. Marsh and shore management. My section reviews all of the applications, including private docks and tidal water bottoms leases. Every marina that you see on the coast of Georgia that's over 500 linear feet is paying for the use of that water space. So we use a variety of equipment to assist with that, including survey grade equipment, and near survey grade equipment and UAVs and drones. This is very interesting. Does anybody know what this this is? Huh? That's the cargo ship that rolled over one year ago today, yesterday, out between St. Simons Island and Jekyll. And by the way, it's still there. My team was the first team on the site at sunrise um, that were, were out there with law enforcement, the U.S. Coast Guard, but we were the first aircraft in the air with one of our drones to monitor the, the fuel spill, and it, it, it had something like 120,000 gallons of crude oil on board. They pumped every bit of it off with a minimal spill. They're going to be removing this um, in the next six to ten weeks, they've already identified what sections of the boat they're going to cut up. They're going to bring in a gantry crane, and they're going to cut each, of the, each section of the boat up, and it has 1,400 cars on it. So they built a corral around the vessel to catch any parts that come off or vehicles that spill out as they pull them up, and they're going to put them on 
put the sections of the boat on a barge and then take it over to the land and unload it. We do, that's Catherine Cummings, one of my assistants, and we do inspections of all dock facilities that are in Georgia waters as well, private docks. This is one of the coolest things we've done. Following Hurricane Irma and Matthew, we removed 22,000 tons of marine debris. Do the math. That's a lot of stuff. Uh, and those were confirmed with tipping fees at the local... Um, at the local uh, uh, dumps. We also recycled approximately 22% of the materials that we withdrew out of the water. We handled 43 sunken vessels. In Georgia, you don't have to have insurance on your boat. Only um, responsible boaters do. Out of the 43 vessels, we only had two boats that had insurance. So your tax dollars paid for the removal of their vessels. We have two drones that we currently are operational right now. We have a third one that's going through test phase, but we use this information. If you are interested in working in the wildlife resource management area, think seriously about getting certified in S3, ArcPad, ArcMap, or ArcGIS products. Those, once you get certified, you're, you, it's, you're worth a lot to the employer. We also are starting a new program with oyster and clam ag agriculture. And so part of the things we do is we assist the farmers that are using state waters to grow oysters. Georgia oysters traditionally grow to the size of a dollar bill which are not marketable to, the, to, a, to a, a restaurant because when you get an oyster that's the size of a, basically a hoagie, a hoagie bun, nobody wants but two oysters. It doesn't fit on a, on a soda cracker. So they want these palm oysters so that you, when you buy a dozen, you need a dozen more. So what my son does is he does the water quality to make sure that these oysters and shellfish and are clean. Georgia has the most extensive water quality program in the United States and we ensure that the food that comes out of there is, is clean. The other thing is that they do is they make sure that our beaches are safe and clean. If you hear of a beach advisory in Georgia, it's not from human contamination. It's because we're on the migratory bird path from South America all the way up to Antarctica and the Arctic. Excuse me, Antarctica and the Arctic. And um, the, the birds are the ones that are landing on our beach and pooing. So, but we issue the advisory so people can make a personal choice of whether or not they want to go swimming or not. We just opened our first um, sh uh, water quality lab in 20 years, and uh, we, this is part of us, excuse me, this is part of us ensuring that um, your shellfish and beaches are clean. We used to rely on commercial entities, and uh, we weren't getting the response that we needed. So if you're interested in this, we'll train you in this. Get your biology degree, we'll, we'll train you in this. Also, we do checks on all the, uh, the shelf, the uh, shrimp and that type of thing, trawls. Uh, and we base the opening and closing of the shrimp season on what our marine fishery section determines. This is cool. Um, Dwayne, if you got a, a group of kids that y'all are doing, or excuse me, cadets that y'all are doing a leadership thing with, if you want to bring them down and give me a heads up, we will get your leadership, your battalion command, your brigade command staff out on one of these research vessels, and they can do a little team building with our biologist to sort fish and, and such and bycatch and learn a little bit about, about coastal Georgia at the same time. We get to go sampling it's fishing 
to the, to the common person, we can't call it fishing because it wouldn't be a job if you got to go fish. But we get to go sample and we get to collect these, these, these fish. They take the fish and they take the otolith bone out, which is the ear bone, and they determine the age of the fish, which enables them to see the growth rate of the fish, the spawn rate of the fish, and that type of thing. So it's important to the fisheries in Georgia that we have this program and again, if you would like to do something where you wear shorts, t-shirt, and flip-flops to work every day, this is it. We also do the shark surveys. This is a bit dangerous. <laughs> they have teeth that will bite. Um, I don't do this. I've never done this. Um, but they will catch them and release them, and they will also check and see if the animal is pregnant. They use a sonogram to determine if it's, if, it's, if it's going to give birth soon so they can monitor the shark population. Honestly, the shark population does give, is an indicator for how healthy the fisheries are. We also collect carcasses from all of the major um, marinas on the coast. They just drop the carcass in a bag and then they come out and they check the, the, the carcasses for length, sex, age, and, and again, the otolith bone, and determine the age of the fish. Georgia Power has been a wonderful uh, partner in providing these for us. We also build artificial reefs. Um, and through these artificial reefs, um, it, en it enhances the fishing for the, for the local fishermen and also encourages game fish and such as that to, to populate these, these, uh, these reefs. Um, I'm working in enforcement action at Gray's Reef right now for, uh, so that we'll do an enforcement action on federal court for someone fishing a portion of the federal waters without permission. We also maintain uh, 83 structures for the public to either get access to the water by their boat or to fish from. Uh, by the way, that's not how you want to park your boat on the ramp like that. But that's a civilian um, who just unloaded his boat. Uh, ideally, he would carry it down and put it on the service boat, service dock. We do something called Coast Fest. This is the last one we did was in October of 2019. Uh, we're not doing one this year because of COVID, but it's attended by approximately 14,000 people. And uh, it's a, sometimes it's the first exposure to coastal resources that people have. And uh, we try to make it as fun as possible. This year we're doing a virtual one. So you get to, you get to come and you get to touch all the fish and shrimp, stingrays, skates, and such as that. And it's free. That's my contact information. And uh, Dwayne says that I'm going to have a question and answer. Um, so I wanted to get through this and spend the, as much time as I could with y'all with the question and answer. Who's first? Yes, sir. My little brother went to North Georgia. Yes, sir. Cadet Pat Baggett. Cadet Baggett from North Georgia. So my question is, so upon getting a major in marine bio, out of all the jobs that you've discussed, does that enable us to get any one of those positions? Yes, it would, including working for me in enforcement. Now, what I tell people, if you want to be a scientist, don't come to work for me. But you will use your science to do your job. You have to have a knowledge of coastal marshlands and, and the vegetation and the um, estuarine area in order to, to protect it. You have to have a basic knowledge of it. So at the same time, I will immerse you in Georgia law, in Georgia code. And so every case that I do goes 
to court via the Attorney General's office in, this, in Atlanta, um, which is a little different than game wardens. They go to local state court judges, whereas we don't. Every position that I showed you today requires a marine biology degree or a biology degree. So if you have a fisheries degree, it can be freshwater, it can be saltwater. But um, the, the young lady that I uh, have working for me, she, is a, she has a, a major in biology and a minor in uh, forest management. So and I'm fixing to hire someone else. So if you're getting ready to graduate, let me know. Next question. Don't make me tell a story. Okay, you're making me tell a story. I came back from Panama in 1989, and my son, I was in the shower, and he stuck his head around the door in the bathroom and said, Pop, Daddy, I love you. I said, I love you too, son. And my four-year-old stuck his head around the door and said, I love you more. I says, well, why do you love me more, John Thomas? He goes, and by this time, I was brushing my teeth. He goes, BJ drops your toothbrush in the commode, and I loved you enough to get it out. So there I was, had been in, down in Panama, going through general warfare school, and uh, I end up brushing my teeth with a toothbrush fresh out of the commode. So that's a, that's a daddy story. I called my doctor, he said I probably wouldn't get sick. So not to encourage y'all to go wash your toothbrush out in a commode or anything like that. So. Anything? Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering, as an airman myself, what made you leave the Air Force and go Army? That's a very good question. I met my wife in college. I had been a college athlete. I really wanted to do something um, outgoing. But my wife wanted me to get my college degree. So... I joined the Air Force after going to all the branches of service, and she picked for what, that I would go to the Air Force. I went in as a 70250B, which is in the Army, a 42 Alpha, which is a clerk, which I worked 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, and it enabled me to go to college on the weekends and not be on the flight line. I'd originally planned to go to the Army or the Marines upon, upon leaving the Air Force after I made my wife happy. Okay, so if wife ain't happy, nobody's happy. So um, that's the real reason why I joined the Air Force. Um, and uh, I also was trying to get stationed back in my hometown of Valdosta, Georgia, on my last duty assignment, and that actually happened. I got stationed at Valdosta in Moody. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the reason why. That's the honest-to-goodness reason. And I went and joined the Florida Army National Guard within five weeks of me separating from the, uh, from the Air Force. So I didn't have a break in service. I loved it. I did. It was, a, it was a blast. My wife went with me on every, she had concurrent, she moved with me to our Japan on my first assignment, and she was with me the whole time. So, um, and ironically, I was telling Dwayne, I was a goalkeeper, soccer player in college. And um, I got selected to be on the Air Force's PACAF, Pacific Air Command's um, soccer traveling goodwill team. So six months out of the year, I didn't even, I, I was just, I was wearing a, a, a soccer uniform and sweats. I mean, it was pretty interesting. So I traveled all over the, the Far East. The Air Force was very good to me. But I enjoyed the Army because of the athleticism required to be in the Army. Um, so, any other questions? Yes, Sergeant Major. Uh, good morning, sir. Um, Cadet Baker from Hawaii. Um, last night, sir, you mentioned something about being a party lieutenant um, or something similar. I forgot exactly, but my advice, well, the advice I wanted was um, being in a leadership position, how do you lead others so right now we're all cadets we have cadet leadership how do and we have our friends that are up under us so how do you lead them but also kind of 
keep it professional, but right. then also, you know, keep that, that friend relationship. Well, you know, it's like we talked about last night. In the cadet environment, you all are cooperating and graduating. You all have a common goal. When you get out in the real world, it's, it's important that you understand there's a hierarchy. Now, that's a good question, because Dwayne and I talked about that this morning. In my latter part of my career, one of the officers that I supervised made the same rank as I did. But I went to work for him when he was the Brigade XO, and I was the Brigade S3. And we had a sit down. He goes, hey, Buck, I know you're good at this kind of stuff, and I'm good at this stuff. Let's delineate what we're going to do so I don't get in your lane and you don't get in my lane. And so we sat down, even though I was his senior at one point, now he's mine on paper, that we worked out our roles. And the other flip side of that is that in your environment, if you go into as a platoon leader, company commander, battalion XO, whatever, you're going to sit down with your subordinates, your immediate subordinates, and you're going to give them a counseling statement that's going to outline your command, your command philosophy, your supervisory philosophy, how you're going to handle various situations. And routinely, my counseling statements were anywhere from six to eight pages long, single-spaced. Um, and then you're probably, if you're a company commander, you're going to send out a command philosophy letter that talks about your open door policy, equal opportunity, sexual harassment, a variety of things on where you stand and how you're going to enforce those things. And, um, but it's important that you do not show favoritism, but you can rely on your friends because you can trust them, but at the same time, you have to enforce the integrity standards that I talked about last night. That you, integrity is the only thing that your command will be remembered for if you did everything right the first time, even when you messed up. You can't control all factors. So you can't control what an individual soldier will do or a cadet will do when he makes a bad decision. But you can have the command structure set up so that you keep everybody informed and you do the right thing when something inappropriate happens or appropriate. So you can commend those soldiers. You always commend the soldiers when they've done well. That's everything from thanking them in formation to giving them a two-day pass to giving coins and awards. Yes, sir. Tell me you're a football player. <laughs> Cadet White from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. What made you decide to go into the field of biology? Um, at the time, I was making under $30,000. A job came open, <laughs> and I just got it. It was one of those things that, um, that uh, I was not hired to be a biologist. I was hired to manage a program a $1.25 million a year program. And so um, my degree is actually in human resource management. Um, I was, was brought in and hired to manage the permitting section in 1999. And then uh, my, my supervisor, went on a boss lift with the Georgia National Guard. We flew him up to Fort Stewart. He saw me run my company, because I was a company commander at the time, Bradley equipped, and we were training to go to Bosnia. I came back to the office. He goes, I'm wasting your ability. And he promoted me within six weeks to the position that I'm in now. And so um, it, is, uh, it was my guard and my military experience my leadership, the management of 16 combat vehicles that cost $2.1 million a piece and all the moving parts that go with he saw. So if you're going, like for instance, my son has got a degree in public health. He's fixing to become a, a medical services officer. He's going to go from infantry to medical services officer because that's where his degree is at. He wants to do an enhancement. Now with me in the infantry, I wanted to do something totally different than what my job was. I could have been a 
a MP, I didn't want to do that. I could have been a provost marshal. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something different from what I did every day. I didn't care to do enforcement uh, in, my, in my weekend job. Questions? What's the time look like, Dwayne? Okay. Um, in the job that we do, you will spend um, probably 10 hours a week on a boat. I don't salt fish because I'm on a boat so much. Um, uh, my section gets four hours of helicopter time a month. You may not think that's a lot of flight time, but you get tired of flying, but you have to. Um, and then the rest of the time is spent doing research and, and, and everything that we have to do to build a case to go to court. I've had four court cases in the last four years go to the Supreme Court of Georgia, and we've won every case. So important to that is that these environmental laws require case law um, in order to, to uphold it in future decisions by the court. And so we enabled our program in the, law of, in the laws in Georgia for the marshlands and the shore to, um, to use case law in future enforcement actions. And so that's important because it acknowledges the role of the Georgia Department of Natural Resources in managing our resources, whether it's in, in the mainland, the mountains, the lowlands, the coastal zone, or the marsh, or the beach. So it's, it, the work that we do, period, on both sides of the house, the fishery side or the side that I work on, um, requires great attention to detail. So that's what you're learning here at GMC is the attention to detail it takes to be a platoon leader. When you become a platoon leader, if you're in a, uh, a maneuver element, you're going to have to know everything there is to know about that soldier down to the amount of water in his canteen. So you know what you have to submit on the orange report through your platoon sergeant to the first sergeant to get a log pack and to sell how much water you need to resupply your guys and your gals. So that type of attention to detail is needed by the employer community, especially where we work. Because if you're collecting scientific data, that data's got to be correct. The decisions that we work on in our office at the Coastal Resource Division are all well-informed, science-based decisions. So that if we're asking this legislature to change a fishing requirement or the DNR board to change a hunting season or a fishing season or the size of a catch, it's all based upon science. It's not just arbitrary questions that are answered with arbitrary answers. It, they are based completely upon science. So the, the things that you're getting here, the groundwork you're getting here with having to manage your cadets and when you, when you go to your BOLIC course, you'll, it'll transition right into the civilian world. So. I will tell you this on the mobilization side, <clears throat> we talked about this last night. If you're getting married, Make sure that your spouse understands your responsibilities to the country and the state because my son just came off of a rotation to Afghanistan, 14 months, and then was home for two months and got picked up for COVID for 96 days. So he's been gone from his family on and off for 15 months in the last 18 months. So it's important that you understand that your spouse and your family are squared away with what your decision is to support your state and nation. And at the same time, you gotta have your personal effects lined up, your checking account, everything squared away. If you have a dog or a cat, an animal care plan, a family care plan, you know, that type of thing. 
Um, I mean, it's just important to, to, to know what you're going to do with your 150-pound Labrador retriever that you've been feeding chocolate bonbons on the sofa with. Not that I don't, haven't had a 100-pound Labrador retriever that got anything he wanted. Um, I just had a, my favorite dog of all time passed away. His name is Sebastian, was Sebastian Janikowski Bennett. Um, and Sebastian was a basset hound who lived for 14 years. A basset hound normally lives 8 to 12 years. But Sebastian got anything he wanted. If he wanted grits, I cooked him grits. If he wanted a bacon, I gave him a whole pound of bacon. He may have been a very large basset hound, but they can't tell me he wasn't happy. And uh, I had to put him down uh, in May, but his last meal was a ice cream bowl of ice cream, and then we, were put, we put him to sleep. But I don't say y'all do that, because y'all got to maintain physical fitness. And this new Army PT test, I'm glad I got out. I'm just telling you. My son is in tremendous shape and just passed the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency's physical fitness test for an interview. And it's, 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 it's killing him. You know, it was something to say, Dwayne, the two-mile run, you could, you could do that three days a week and be good. Now you've got to do dumbbells and, ke and kettlebells and, you know, all those crazy things to stay in shape. Deadlift. I didn't do a deadlift, but when I, went through, when I got selected to go to OCS and basic training, you had to lift the 75 pounds over your head, and that was it. Not anymore. So I just want to tell you all thank you. Um, this has been a, um, a tremendous honor to be allowed to come and speak to you folks. And if you all want to write down my email, that's the best way to get a hold of me. The bottom number is my personal number, and that's my desk number. I gave you those two because I do have voicemail on them. The voicemail for the top number goes to my email. I'll be glad to, um, to uh, converse with you all and give you advice. I am tracking uh, some of your classmates from a couple years ago that are lieutenants that I am assisting with uh, career choices and giving some advice. And the advice that I gave last night, it's not all about combat arms. Um, there's a bigger army out there than just the infantry, the artillery, aviation, and that type of thing. Logistics, medical services, those type of things are just as important, if not more important. Only 15% of the, of the fighting force actually fights. The other percentage is what puts the fight forward. Somebody's got to get the fuel to the, uh, to the mechanized infantry guy. Somebody's got to get the, the powder bags to the artillery. And somebody's got to get the bombs and the fuel to the helicopter pilots. So just remember that. And the, the new commands in the military intelligence community with the uh, cybersecurity that, that they're getting involved in and the active mission, those are important as well. Dwayne, that's all I've got.